I grew up in a Christian home, and, and uh, from a young age, I was taught the Christian way to go about relationships. And I had, you know, by the time I was 13, I had my promise ring. I had my abstinence commitment. But as I be- entered my teen years, I basically had the philosophy that I was living for myself, and yet I sort of fit Jesus in whenever it was convenient. I knew it was going to heaven in the end. I didn't want to make God mad at me. So I tried to live a bit more morally than the rest of the people around me. When it came to movies, I wouldn't watch the really bad ones. When it came to music, I was a little bit careful, you know, not to listen to the really raunchy stuff. When it came to purity, I said, okay, purity is the edge of a cliff. As long as I don't fall off that cliff, you know, it's okay if I take a little step, a little step, a little step. And I kept giving my heart, my emotions, and even my body away to one guy after the next. And I told myself that as long as I stay on this side of the cliff, as long as I'm technically a virgin, I'm on God's good side. But after three or four relationships where I had my heart broken and I gave so much of myself to one guy after the next, I began to realize that I wasn't pure. Every time a relationship ended, it felt like someone had taken my heart and my emotions and ripped them out and, and shattered them all over the ground into a million pieces. And I remember laying on my bed one night crying after another breakup. Some guy had dumped me after I'd given everything to him. And God, I began to pray and say, God, what am I doing wrong? You know, I'm, I'm on this side of the cliff. Look at all my friends. You know, they've crossed over that line so many times. I'm doing, I'm doing so much better. I thought I was doing this your way. And God began to speak to my heart. And it wasn't an audible voice, but it was sort of like, Leslie, you need to give me control of this area of your life. You need to let me write your love story. As long as you are trying to live for self and fit me into your life, you're going to be hitting disaster after disaster after disaster. You're going to be giving away what was only meant for your future husband, and you're never going to experience my best for you in this area of your life. It was a few weeks later, I was reading my Bible, Proverbs 31, my proverb for the day, and there was a verse that stood out to me. The wife of godly character does her husband good and not harm all the days of her life. I started thinking about that word, all, all the days of her life. I've never known any woman that's been married all the days of her life. So God, does that mean I'm supposed to begin like loving my husband like now, even before I know his name, know who he is or where he is? And God really began to convict me and say, that's exactly what it means. That's what real purity is. It's not just keeping yourself on this side of the cliff. It's realizing that your life is not your own. First and foremost, it belongs to me. And second of all, it belongs to your future husband. And every time you give your heart, your emotions, your affections, your physical body, it doesn't matter if you've got your technical virginity still. You're giving away a treasure that was only meant for the person that I meant for you to spend the rest of your life with. I begin to think, what if two people could begin loving each other all the days of their life before they ever even met each other? They could actually be faithful to each other, not just sort of say, well, I'll try to stay on this side of the cliff. I'll try to hang on to that abstinence commitment and barely, and I hopefully, you know, my future husband or wife will appreciate that someday. But to literally say every thought, every action, every attitude, every emotion, the way that I interact with the opposite sex, even in friendships, I want to honor that person in every possible way. That would be the foundation for an incredible love story. And that's what I decided I wanted for my life at the age of 16. It definitely wasn't an easy commitment to make, but I said to God that day, I said, okay, God, the next time I give my heart, my emotions, my physical body, any part of myself to a guy, it will not be until I know it's the husband that you've chosen for me. And even then, it will be in the right time and in the right context, and I won't just be giving all of this stuff away ahead of time. And I felt great and heroic when I prayed that prayer, but then the next few days and weeks and months, I went out into the world and I started to get really depressed because I looked around and I didn't see even one guy that seemed to value purity like that in a girl. And I thought, I saw all my friends hooking up with guy after guy and I thought, you know what? I have just made the biggest mistake of my life. I pictured myself sitting for the rest of my existence in my bedroom in wearing this long gray tent-like dress. I don't know why I pictured the dress. That just went with the image. And I would just be sitting there rocking my life away in a rocking chair, staring out the window, drool coming down my mouth. I don't know why the drool either, but this was what I pictured. 
And maybe I'd get married when I was in my 80s to some guy I didn't even like. You know, that was God's version of a love story. But I found out that God is a much better author of romance than I ever could be. And as I was setting my life aside and attempting to live in true purity and honoring my future husband, somewhere else in the world was this man named Eric Ludy. I, uh, <laughs> I hadn't met him yet. I didn't know where he was or what he was doing, but he had made a very similar commitment. He made a lot of mistakes in relationships. He'd given his heart and, and, and done a lot of things that he regretted in that area of his life. But then God began to speak to him about his future wife and what true purity was. And he was beginning to live for me and set his life aside for me and, and honor me with the way that he interacted with the opposite sex. And you know what he even did for me? He prayed for me every night for his future wife out there. And he even wrote me love letters and love poems. And you may not be able to tell from his fiery presentation that you're seeing tonight, but Eric is a hopeless, incurable romantic. And he, uh, he cries in Disney movies and Anne of Green Gables and things like that. And uh, <laughs> so it's very sweet. But he would write love letters to his future wife. And on our honeymoon, he gave me an entire notebook full of these letters that he had written to me years before we ever even met. And they were, they didn't have my name on them, but they were, dear whoever you are, and I'm thinking of you tonight, I'm praying for you, I'm, I'm setting my life aside for you, I'm so excited for the day that God will bring you into my life. And as I read through page after page after page of these amazing letters of this man who was living in complete faithfulness to me during all those years when I doubted if this decision would be worth it, I thought, wow, God does write the best love stories. And even though making those choices to walk a narrow road and to live different than the rest of this culture are very, very difficult in the time, at the time that you're doing it, and you're oftentimes filled with doubts and, and thinking, is this really necessary? Is this really worth it? God honors those who are willing to go all the way for him, who are willing to understand what true Christianity is and give up their very life, everything for him. It wasn't just relationships and purity that God began to convict me of in that season of my life. It was every area. And I remember kneeling down by my bed and offering him my future, my friendships, my popularity status, all the dreams and plans and hopes that I had. In fact, I even came to the point where I said, God, even if you want to keep me single for the rest of my life, I want, you, I want you to write my story, not just my love story, my entire life story. And my whole life radically changed when I began to live that way. But that was when I truly started living. That was the, the only way that God could have written this amazing love story with Eric. A lot of people read our story or know of our story, and they think, oh, I want that. I want that kind of a beautiful romantic love story. But don't understand. It has to flow out of a decision to give up your life. It has to flow out of an attitude of complete and total surrender. Even after marriage, you can't cling to your spouse, your husband or your wife for your, your happiness and your fulfillment. I think a lot of times as girls, we look to the, the time in our life when we're finally gonna meet that guy and he's gonna be the perfect guy and carry us away and sweep us off our feet. That's when we'll really be fulfilled. That's when we'll really be happy. And I know for me, it was whenever I had a guy in my life, I felt secure and fulfilled. But whenever I didn't have a guy in my life, I was insecure and lonely and confused and I didn't know who I was. God began to show me that the only way I'd really be ready for a beautiful love story is he, Jesus Christ, had to become my first love. He had to become my all in all and he had to become my everything. And I had to take that attitude even into my marriage with Eric because he wants to die a martyr's death. You know, there's no guarantees that I'll always have him around if God wants to take him home. And if, if my happiness is dependent on him, it, even as amazing of a husband as he is, he's still gonna let me down. He's still human. But Jesus Christ will never let me down. And if you can learn to find your, your fulfillment and make Jesus Christ your first love before you, meet your love, you, you get into a beautiful love story and keep him at the center after you're married, you have the foundation for an incredible love story because I don't have to wake up in the morning and look at Eric and say, come on, you need to be this perfect knight in shining armor. You need to meet this need and meet that need. 
I look to Christ to meet and fulfill my needs, and then I'm satisfied and secure, and I can come to my husband and say, how can I serve you, not how can you give to me? That's really the secret of what makes a love story beautiful. If you want to know the best way to prepare for an amazing love story right now, a lot of people will tell you, if you just date around and kind of get to know a whole bunch of different people and see who you're compatible with, I realized that dating wasn't really setting me up for great preparation for marriage. It was setting me up for probably more like divorce because I would just meet a guy, flippantly get into a relationship with him, and then when things didn't work out, we just end it and go on to the next person. Well, that's not a very good foundation for a lifelong marriage relationship. God's not into temporary relationships. He's into lifelong, eternal relationships. And I realized that the best way to prepare for a God-written love story was to fall in love with Jesus Christ, to build my life around him, to make him the center of my existence. And my love story with Eric was the outflow of that decision. Instead of just trying to fit Jesus Christ into my life and live a little bit more moral existence than everyone around me, I began to build my entire life around him. And my life radically changed. But like I said, that was when I truly discovered fulfillment, joy, peace. That decision that I made to make him my everything, make him my all in all, and give up my own selfish pursuits and selfish pleasures was when I truly started living the gospel life. And as unromantic as it may sound, that is the secret to a God-written love story.